Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Chairman Powell, nice to have you back. And thank you for your accessibility and the conversations you have with all of us and both parties on this committee. Uh, before we start, I want to say a few words about what happened last night uh, when we got word that Jesse Liu's nomination had been withdrawn. She was to appear in front of uh, this committee, or she was, a, was going to appear in front of the Senate. Uh, when President Trump withdrew her nomination, uh, she was going to appear in front of this committee tomorrow. I, I heard some of you, my colleagues and my friends, say that the president would be chastened by impeachment. Some of you told me you knew what he, the president did was wrong. Some of you privately to me told me that how much you think he lies. Um, but that, you also said publicly, that wasn't enough to rise to the level of removal from office. And many of you asserted that he had learned his lesson. He would not do these things again. He wouldn't try to, through illegal means, try to change the 2020 election. It's pretty clear the President of the United States did learn a lesson. The lesson, he can do whatever he wants, whatever he wants, he can abuse his office, he'll never, ever be held accountable by this Senate. That was the lesson. He's now, since acquittal, gone on a retribution tour, starting at the prayer breakfast. A prayer breakfast, mind you, continuing through the East Room, where many of you were in the audience and applauded him as he personally attacked and uh, attacked uh, people who have served this country. He removed Colonel Venman, a Patriot and Purple Heart recipient who spent his life serving our country. He mocked his accent, his, his accent from his Ukrainian accent. He removed Ambassador Sondland, a Trump appointee, after he testified to the quid pro quo. And yesterday, and the reason I'm bringing this up today, is he continued the tour, interfering at the Department of Justice, strong-arming political appointees to overrule career prosecutors. Those attorneys withdrew in protest. Those professionals, I have no idea their political party, their professionals withdrew in protest from the case, and at least in one case, resigned entirely from the, from the department. We, can't give him a, we cannot give him a permanent license to turn the presidency and the executive branch into his own personal vengeance operation. You all know it's happening. Even the senator that just walked out knows, knows that it's happening. I'm afraid that's what we're seeing, a personal vengeance operation. No one should be above the law. If we, if we say nothing, and I include everybody in this committee, I include myself, if we say nothing, it will, it will get worse. His behavior will get worse. The retribution tour will, will continue. We all know that. Um, Mr. Chairman, now on to, um, to the issue at hand. I welcome Chairman Powell back. Earlier this week, Bloomberg reported on a profitable and fast-growing Spanish company. Grifols has opened up branches in 36 states. They buy and sell plasma, nice clinical-sounding word that means blood, as we know. Americans who are struggling to make ends meet are lining up to sell their blood to put food on the table. The blood harvesting business is booming. Grifols stock is doing great. It's hard to think of a better metaphor for the Trump economy. On Monday, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ both reached record highs. 2019, J.P. Morgan Chase had the best year for any U.S. bank in history, $36 billion, $36,000 million in profits. Big corporations are spending hundreds of billions of dollars on stock buybacks and dividends. On paper, the economy has been expanding uninterrupted for over 10 years, although the growth the last three years of the Obama administration has been greater than the growth of the first three years of the Trump administration. We know that, too. But if you talk to the vast majority of people who rely on paychecks, not investment portfolios to earn a living, you get a very different story. They've been bleeding for years. Most families don't understand why the harder they work, sometimes at more than one job, the harder it gets to afford pretty much everything, child care, health care, rent, college tuition. The people in this room may remember last September when the financial industry went into a panic over a benchmark interest rate passing 10%. Wall Street faced uncertainty, so we respond. Fed leapt into action. Smart government employees came up with a plan that led to the Fed Federal Reserve lending about $200 billion every day into financial markets through a mechanism that hasn't been used since the financial crisis. $200 billion every day. 
let me be clear, I don't think it's wrong for the Fed to be creative and make sure the economy keeps working. It's in everybody's interest, Mr. Chairman, for banks to keep lending money and credit to keep flowing so businesses can invest and manufacture, consumers can buy houses and cars. My problem is this, when, Wall St when Main Street faces uncertainty, no one at the Fed jumps to action or gets creative. The President doesn't criticize by tweet in person, or by, by name, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve when he says, he never demands corporations raise wages for their workers, that's not ever his criticism of Chairman Powell. It's hard for families to understand why Wall Street gets worked up about a 10% interest rate when so many families are lucky if the payday lender down the street charges them less than 400%. Small businesses having trouble making payroll don't have access to so-called repo funding at their local Fed branch. Fed doesn't take action, doesn't take action when its own research has found that 40% of Americans don't have the cash. I mean, think about that, 40, probably not many people in this hearing room, but 40% of Americans don't have $400 in cash when their car breaks down to get to work to be able to fix it. So they go to the payday lender and then things spiral down. Nobody raises alarm bells when 40 million Americans predict They'll miss at least one credit card payment, which puts, which means $1.2 billion in late fees will flow from the pockets of struggling families to help J.P. Morgan and Chase uh, earn $36 billion last year. Serious people haven't dropped everything to bring down the cost of housing or raise wages once they found out that one in four renters are paying more than half their income toward housing. One thing goes wrong in their life, their lives turn upside down. People look at that, they see two different economies and two different responses. We hear a lot about the divides in this country between red and blue, between rural and urban, the coasts and the heartland. People watch MSNBC and people that watch Fox. But people in all these places feel no matter how hard they work, they can't maintain any real economic security. The real divide I see is between those whose problems are considered an emergency and those whose struggles Wall Street and large parts of Washington decided they, they can ignore. The Fed needs to get creative for the people who make this country work, particularly it's become pretty clear that the president and the majority leader are simply not about to. President Trump brags about a soaring stock market that he's pumped up with his deficit-busting million-dollar tax breaks for billionaires, deficits exceeding a trillion dollars. Don't hear much about that anymore. And now he wants to pay for those tax cuts. Sorry, we got a big deficit. We got to pay for those tax cuts, as he said in Davos and he's saying in his budget, by cutting Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. He lies about a blue-collar boom. I heard it at the State of the Union that night. I was fairly incredulous. When my own state of Ohio, job growth has been anemic or non-existent. Manufacturing jobs are stalling compared to when he took office. And now in his budget, after promising workers in Lordstown, Ohio, don't sell your homes, we'll bring those jobs back to kill the loan program that was giving the community of Lordstown a little bit of hope that some manufacturing jobs actually would come back. Chairman Powell, you and your highly capable staff at the Fed have been proactive and creative in protecting Wall Street and the money markets from the president's erratic behavior, and I'm glad you have. We're all appreciative of that. But what I hope to hear from you today is how you're going to be proactive and use that same level of creativity to make this economy work for everyone else.